Church, let's grab our Bibles. We're in Isaiah 53 this morning, the very heart of this great prophecy. When you find Isaiah chapter 53, let's stand up together for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be reading verses 3 through 9 this morning. And as you stand, let's recall intentionally that God's Word is holy. It is inspired. It is inerrant. It is the very authoritative Word of the only true and living God. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 9. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. All right, I want to throw you into a hypothetical situation this morning. I want you to imagine with me, if you will, that you are in an Uber. If you've ever done that before, it's pretty cool. And you're going from the, uh, the airport to the hotel. And as you have about a 20-minute drive, you are sitting there and your, your Uber driver is a little bit chatty and wants to get to know you. And is asking you questions about yourself and what you're doing. And it comes to matters of the faith. And it becomes clear within just a few moments that that you are a Christian, you are a, you are a man or a woman of faith in Jesus Christ, and your, your Uber driver, though, is not a Christian, but the kind and sincere fellow that he is, he wants to know why it is that you have faith in Christ. And he begins to ask you questions about your Christianity, and he wants to know. Sincerely, he's asking, he's not putting you on, he's not being duplicitous, he wants to know why it is that you are a Christian and what it is that you have placed your trust in. Now you've got 20 minutes to answer that question. What do you do with it? You don't wanna say something about your feelings, for goodness sakes, about how Christianity makes you feel. That's not really the question. Uh, He has feelings too. The question is not, how does your Christian faith make you feel? The The question is, why do you believe what you believe? And he wants something substantive. He wants something concrete. Uh, He wants something absolute. He wants to know why it is you believe what you believe. So let's pause right here. Let's pause our scenario and just remind ourselves that it's good to be reformed in these situations, right? Because your answer is not going to determine where he ends up spending his eternity. Thank goodness. On your best day, You cannot convert somebody, no matter how well you answer this question. On your worst day, you can't fumble it up so bad that he's going to turn away from the Christian faith forever. The good news about believing our Bibles and the sovereignty of God is that it's the work of the Holy Spirit to convert, not you. And yet, nevertheless, as God uses means to draw his elect to himself, God does very often use the witnessing and the testimonies and the faithful proclamation of his people as a means by which his Holy Spirit converts. So pause again, play this scenario. Now what do you say? So, so what do you do if you have a question related to the, the, the substantive concrete reasons that you believe the gospel. Well, one of the things that you could do in this scenario is you could very well point him to Isaiah 53. Why is that? Because in Isaiah 53, church, we have to understand, we have the most extraordinarily detailed 
and specific prophecy of who Christ is, why he came into the world, what he has done for us, and how that changes our lives. You could point this inquisitive Uber driver to the concrete realities prophesied about our Savior Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah chapter 53, listen, 700 years before it was fulfilled in Christ. That's astounding. That's a good answer. That's a good reply. Point him to Isaiah 53. In fact, that's what Christians have been doing now for 2,000 years. When we look back on the ways that Christians have done the work of apologetics, you know the word apologia in the Greek. It doesn't mean to apologize or to say you're sorry for something, but the work of Christian apologetics means to defend and to explain or to give a rational explanation for why it is that we believe. Christians have for 2,000 years now been pointing to texts like Isaiah 53 as a divine proof by way of revelation who Christ would be and why he has come. And so, for instance, Justin Martyr, one of the earliest apologists, Justin Martyr lived 100 to 165 AD. And his writing is very instructive to us Christians because he's one of the earliest apologists who wrote down his defenses of the Christian faith. And Justin Martyr was specifically concerned to demonstrate the rationality of, of Christianity to his Jewish audience. And not only that, but to a Greek philosophical audience as well. Justin Martyr himself was a former philosopher. And he had been caught up and enamored with the philosophy of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. But eventually he realized that those philosophies are empty. They could not take away the pain in his heart, much less the guilt of his soul. And so Justin Martyr, having heard the gospel, he trusted in Christ and he always tended to use prophecies like Isaiah 53 as a divine proof and demonstration to the rational, concrete, substantive grounding of the Christian faith as an apologetic, a defense to the unbelieving world. And we're going to do that a little bit here this morning. So if you're just joining us, I have to tell you this by way of preface that this text that we have before us this morning is one of the most precious scriptures in all of the Bible. All right. We're in the fourth servant song here in the book of Isaiah. And I just wanted to make this clear how important this passage is to Holy Scripture. Not only is Isaiah 53, 3 to 9, the heart of the fourth servant song. We've seen four servant songs in the latter portions of Isaiah now beginning in chapter 40. Not only is it the heart of that, but it's also the heart of Isaiah's entire prophetic work. And not only that, but it's the heart of the whole prophetic ministry of the entire Old Testament pointing forward to the person and work of Christ. And not only that, but Isaiah 53, we might think of as the epicenter of the entire revelation of God, the entire panoply of scriptural divine revelation to us. It's the very heart of the gospel itself. And in this text, we have every major theme of the Christian faith. We have the sovereignty of God. We have the total depravity and wreckage of sinful human beings that we've brought into our own lives. We have a Redeemer given to us and His atoning work for us, Jesus Christ. We have the responsibility and the call to repentant faith and trust in Him. And we have promises pertaining to the everlasting life that He has secured for us through His suffering. All of that is in this text today. All right. Now, we divided this text into three parts. Last week, we looked at the appearance of the Christ. We talked about his appearance in time. He was a root out of dry ground, etc. We talked about his appearance in form, that he has no beauty or majesty that should, we should desire him or be drawn to him. Nothing of his physical beauty that would set him apart. Last week, we talked about the fact that it's his holiness, his obedience, and his suffering that sets him apart as beloved of God. And today, we're going to look at his affliction. How it is that Christ suffers for us. And so we're going to divide this also into three parts this morning. We're going to look at his affliction related to his heart. Okay. We're going to look at affliction related to his body, his physical body and his suffering. And then thirdly, we're going to look at affliction related to his soul. How it is that his soul even suffered for us atoningly on the cross. Now next week when we come back to the text, we're going to look at our third A. So it's appearance 
affliction, and then next week his award that he has won for himself and for us as believers. So if you have your Bibles, let's make sure that we're open to Isaiah chapter 53. We want to work through this line by line. I'm going to primarily be working on verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 this morning, so you're going to want to direct your attention there. But let's start off by observing that Christ, or the Messiah, or the Ebed Yahweh, the servant of the Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, he suffered, first of all, affliction of his heart. And what I mean by that is psychological suffering or even emotional suffering, if you will. His affliction of heart, look at verses 3 and 4. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows. See that? A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now in Hebrew poetry, very often there's a convention that will be employed in some of the better Hebrew poetry where they use a technique called the chiasmus. And the chiasmus is a, is a poetic convention where you, you, you do some structural apparatus where you move from A to B to C and then back to B to A. So it's A, B, C, B, A. See that? And that's exactly what Isaiah does here in this passage. He goes from man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that's A, B, despised, C, bore our grief, carried our sorrows, B, A. See that? So it's sorrows, grief, despised, grief, sorrows. That's how he structures this poetically. Now, what does it mean, though, to us? That he is a man of sorrows. Our Christ was one who, who suffered of the heart. What does it mean? Well, let me say this. There's, there's a thousand miles in difference between a man of sorrows and a sorrowful man. Okay? Some of us, perhaps, may be sorrowful people, but that's not what Christ is. He's a man of sorrows. Well, what is the difference? A sorrowful person is a person who has many regrets in their life. Uh, they look at their life, they look at the disaster that they've made of themselves, they look at the way that they've brought ruin into their own experience and into the lives of other people. A, a person of sorrows is somebody who has many regrets. Our Christ has no regrets. And in fact, a sorrow isn't necessarily the emotion that best describes his entire being because Christ was a man of joy. Christ was a very joyful person. He was a person of a gladdening spirit. He was a person of great love and happiness. So we're not necessarily saying that his primary emotion was self-pity or self-wallowing. That's not what we mean. Uh, he didn't come with regrets. He didn't come with sorrows for wreckage that he made of his own life or the lives of other people. He was not somebody, by the way, who felt particularly sorry for himself all the time. Some of us can be very good at that, can't we? Amen. Some of us can be very, very good at playing the victim card all of the time. And one of the things that we do, it's one of the ways we try to manipulate people, is by drawing them into our self-pity, our self-wallowing. Some of us are very, very good at the Eeyore syndrome type of effect where you like to draw people into your sadness. That's in a, in a sort of a sickening way, what makes you happy? But again, that's not what we mean when we say that Christ was a man of sorrows. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is simply this, that our, lo our Lord, He loved very, very deeply. And as a response to His loving people very deeply, He often then had to bear vicariously the sorrows of their lives. You see? You see, there's a principle that the more you love, the more deeply you hurt when you see other people that are hurting. Does that make sense? Like indifferent people don't experience this. People that are calloused, people that are, that are careless, people that don't get emotionally involved with other people, they don't become men of sorrows or women of sorrows because they don't simply care enough to bear anyone else's grief. But our Lord, you need to understand this about Him, is that he loved perfectly. And every single person he ever met in any encounter, he had the ability to love them with the whole of his heart, not with a restrained sort of love, but he truly loved other people. And so Tennyson, the poet, is exactly right. It's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. So we understand that this is how love works. 
that when you truly care for somebody, when you truly love somebody, what happens is you expose yourself to the risk of absorbing into your heart their sorrows. You know what I mean by that? Does that make sense? And so Christ, everywhere he goes, he loves people with a full and true and rich heart. And because this world is a world that has a lot of sorrows and pain and sin and wreckage and damage, it's almost like everywhere Jesus goes, he's absorbing, he's carrying, he's bearing the sorrows of all of the people's sin that he meets. And so he goes to the, the, the graveyard and he meets the garrison demoniac. And, and can he remain indifferent to that kind of suffering? No, he cannot. What does he do? He bears that sorrow. He cares for that sorrow. He takes it upon his own shoulders and upon his own life. And this is true everywhere Jesus goes. Every time he meets somebody who suffered loss, uh, when he meets the father whose child recently died, Jesus cares and it hurts him because he loves sinners. Uh, whenever he met a blind person, whenever he met a leper, whenever he met even a religious prideful fool, Jesus had the ability to love that person and so therefore carry their burdens and their sorrows. And that's why we're not surprised when we read something like this. In John 11:33. it says, When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, this is referring to Mary and the loss of Lazarus, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And that's one time we read of Jesus actually weeping because of the sorrows that he bears and carries for others. We also see him weeping as he comes into Jerusalem because he sees the city of God and recognizes they're not ready for their Messiah. Their hearts have gone astray. They've gone far afield from their God. Jesus would look at people and he, he would be moved. The scriptures often says he would be filled with compassion. The Greek word there, splunk, needs am I. It means to feel it in the gut. He would be disturbed and he'd be greatly vexed of soul. It's not because he was indifferent at all. No, it's because of how much he loved. And so it's almost as though everywhere the Lord went, his heart swallowed up the aching hearts of other people. Thus he became for us vicariously a man of sorrows. And there's probably no other place that we see his sorrows being born the heaviest than in that moment in Gethsemane. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 26 and look at this with me in the text. Go to Matthew's Gospel chapter 26. And let's look at verses 36 and following. You can see the sorrows of the Son of God boiling over here in this text. It says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And you probably might even remember that the word Gethsemane literally means oil press. And, and here, uh, the, the love of the Son of God is going to, be, going to be pressed and squeezed, as it were, as, as like uh, oil. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, look at this, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, why is he sorrowful and troubled here? Is he feeling sorry for himself? Is that what's happening? Is this the Eeyore syndrome? Is this self-pity? Is this self-wallowing in despair? Is that why he's sorrowful and troubled here in Gethsemane just hours before the cross? Or just moments before his betrayal? No, that's not why he's sorrowful. Look at verse 38. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. My question to you is this. Why did Jesus fall on his face? Did he trip? Was there a root he didn't see in the dark and he tripped and fell? No, he fell because the sorrows of this world had accumulated to the point in which it was overbearing for him to carry them. And even as he's preparing in heart and mind and body and spirit and otherwise to go to the cross, he is already beginning to feel the weights of his redemptive and atoning responsibility as the only sin bearer of the world. And in Luke's gospel, it doesn't say it in Matthew, but in Luke's gospel, it even says that he sweat such as like blood dropping to the ground. He is already suffering for the sin of the world. And so, yes, our Lord was a joyful 
gladdening, happy, obedient person, but he bore the weight of our sorrows, especially as he approached the cross. Now let's go to the second point, back to our main text, Isaiah chapter 53 this morning. Not only was he one who was afflicted of heart in verse 3, but notice also his affliction of body in verse 5. Now let's be careful to mind the words of the text here this morning. Look at verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. So now we're talking about physical affliction, aren't we? The language of piercing. We're talking about the language of wounds. Uh, the Hebrew word there for wounds literally means open flesh wound. It's the same word he uses in chapter 1, verse 6 of the book of Isaiah. And here, of course, it's impossible to evade the implication that Christ is going to die by way of crucifixion. Okay? The language of piercing here is all too specific to be otherwise. The language of piercing here is indicative of a death by manner of being pierced. Now again, I just want to remind you, this is an extraordinary prophecy written 700 years before it was literally fulfilled in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, pierced to the crossbeams of the cross. Now it's interesting to do a little bit of research about the process of crucifixion because as far as I can tell, now I'm not an archaeologist, so there's a lot that I don't know. As far as I can tell, the ancient process of killing criminals by way of crucifixion goes back to at least 479 BC. That's the earliest record I could find of somebody being crucified. Remember, Isaiah written 700 BC. But 479 BC, we do have a record of Herodotus, one of the ancient historians. He records that the Athenians were so incensed by the war crimes of a Persian general that they literally nailed him to two planks of wood, pierced him there. That's the earliest reference I could find to crucifixion. I'm not saying it's the earliest ever, it's just the earliest I could find. And so crucifixion seems to have come into usage somewhere in the 5th century, excuse me, 5th century BC. And then from that point on, it slowly gained in popularity and usage. Okay. Uh, Alexander the Great, the great king of Greece who conquered the known world, he one time crucified 2,000 men at the Battle of Tyre in 332 BC. Uh, later on, the Roman general, so the Romans borrowed this technique from the Greeks, the Roman general Crassus when he put down Spartacus's slave revolt, I think there's a movie about Spartacus, right? When he put down Spartacus' slave revolt, the former gladiator, he, Crassus, crucified 6,000 men. And so we see the beginning of the usage of crucifixion, and it steadily would grow into the Roman period. The Romans made it into an art form. The Romans loved the terrifying connotations of crucifixion because with a massive geographic territory, how else do you keep all of these various kinds of citizens under control? Well, you do so by terror and by fear. And so the Romans virtually mastered the art of the crucifixion. Here's, here's the wicked thing about crosses, all right? Let me, let me just be honest with you. Almost every other weapon that human beings have ever invented Every other act of warfare, every other act of bloodshedding um, is, is styled so as to kill as many people as fast and efficiently as possible. Okay, that's why we made the gun. That's why we made the machine gun. That's why we make bombs. That's why we make missiles. Because the goal of warfare normally is to kill as many people as fast and efficiently as you possibly can. But crucifixion is entirely different. Why? Because in crucifixion, you don't want to kill fast. In crucifixion, the whole goal, the reason why the Romans perfected it is because it doesn't kill fast. It kills as slowly as possible. 
And so a crucified victim will die by way of asphyxiation. Sometimes it takes hours to die by way of crucifixion. Sometimes it takes even days to die by crucifixion. You'll remember, of course, that the Romans are startled that Christ died so quickly. Remember that line in the Gospels? And the very purpose of crucifixion is that it did not strike to the vital organs, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver. But crucifixion was designed not so that it would kill you quickly, but rather slowly. That's why they pierce you in the nerve centers of the wrists and the feet. That's why it was designed to humiliate and to mock everything about it from the stripping of one naked to the exposure of the flogging and the chastisement to the carrying of the patibula, that's the, the, the cross beam, the horizontal piece. All of that was an acted out mockery of the person being crucified. It was designed to bring maximum shame and maximum physical pain. And Isaiah saw this 700 years before it happened, before people were even routinely being crucified. It specifically says in the text, he was pierced for our transgressions. Now, if you have the King James Version on your lap this morning, or perhaps you have the, uh, the new King James Version, you'll notice that the word stripes in verse 5 in the ESV is rendered wounds. Okay, by his wounds, we are healed. Stripes is probably a better picture there of the flogging that the whips would result in these stripes, these linear lacerations along the back and the legs and whatnot. But, but despite all that, and we, we could gross ourselves out here with the particularities of crucifixion all day. That's not my point. My point here in verse 5 is that you would notice that this too is carried out vicariously for the benefit of his elect. Look carefully at the verse. Five times in verse five. Five times, excuse me, four times in verse five. Count them. Four times in verse five. It tells us that he did this for us or for our benefit. Look at this. But he was pierced for our transgressions. That's one. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's two. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. That's three. And with his wounds, we are healed. That's four times in one verse. Okay. So the theologians, they call this, and I need you to understand, you have to understand this to understand the gospel. Okay. The theologians call this a substitutionary atonement. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know the word substitute. The substitute literally means to stand in the place of another. You know it from sports. In sports, soccer, for instance, a substitute is one who comes in on behalf of the other. Uh, when a substitute is called in the second half of the game, for instance, one person runs onto the field and another person runs off. Presumably because this person, the substitute, is more qualified for the moments than the person who is removed from the field of play. Same thing too in education. We have the concept of a substitute teacher. What is a substitute teacher? It's one who comes in and stands in the place of the teacher where he or she cannot be there or is otherwise unqualified, perhaps due to illness or weakness or family tragedy or whatever other reason. The substitute comes in and stands where the other cannot stand in that moment. And so what's happening for us in the crucifixion is that Christ is coming in to be our sin substitute because we're not qualified to go to our own cross. We deserve it. No question about that. But only one who has a perfect, flawless, obedient, beautiful life can be a sin substitute for somebody else. Nobody else has that qualification other than Christ. And so you say to yourself, well, what kind of sin can this act absolve? I say to you, every kind of sin, from A to Z. Any sin you're willing to confess, any iniquity you are willing to name, trusting and believing in Christ by faith, He can and will absolve every kind of sin that you are willing to confess from A to Z. In fact, let's do it. Adultery, blasphemy, conceit, drunkenness, envy, fornication, greed, homosexuality, idolatry, judgmentalism, killing, lust, murder, neglect, oppression, pornography, 
quarreling, racism, sodomy, theft, usury, violence, wantonness, xenophobia, youthful passion, zeal for evil. If you bring it to Christ on the cross, he will take it away from you by grace. That's the good news of the gospel right there. This is why Paul said in that immortal line, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that transversal? Christ, who had no sin, made to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Calvin calls that the great exchange. And if you've received Christ by grace through faith, then all of your sin, past, present, and future, is placed upon him in his death. And what, what do you get in return? All of his peace, all of his righteousness, all of his standing before the Father, all of his record of obedience, all of that is yours by grace because of the cross. But if you have not Jesus, then you will have all of the pain that sin deserves in hell. That's the exchange. So Christ suffers of the heart in being the man of sorrows. He suffers affliction in the body by bearing the pain of cross bearing and crucifixion for us. Then notice too, he also bears affliction of soul on our behalf. So look at verse 6 in your Bible. We all, Isaiah says, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now two things are remarkable about verse 6. First of all, I want you to notice how sin isolates and removes you from the fellowship. Look at this. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned everyone to his own way. You follow sin long enough, it will eventually isolate you from everybody you love. And not only that, but sin will eventually isolate you from the very presence of God himself. Sin always results in this eternal loneliness and despair. We have all, like sheep, gone his own way. We have turned everyone to his own way. Turn and look around, and you will see yourself completely alone if you don't have a Savior. Okay? But look at this, too. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I want you to think about the suffering of soul that Christ experienced for us. Because we all know what it feels like to be guilty. Right? We all know what it feels like to be caught when you're guilty. We all probably, maybe going back to elementary school or something like that, we know what it feels like to be guilty, to be caught, and then to be publicly exposed as guilty. It's a terrible feeling, one of the most, one of the worst feelings you can ever go through, right? What we don't know, what we cannot relate to, what there is no analogy for is what it feels like to bear the weight of the guilt of the world. Only Christ knows that feeling. And so Christ, as the Son of God, He is sent by the Father to perform this work of redemption and atonement for us. But something took place between the persons of the Trinity that you and I can never experience. The Trinity was not broken. The Trinity was not rended. Nothing like that. But as Jesus is dying for us on the cross, he experiences this absolute affliction and turmoil of soul as the sin bear that you and I cannot possibly even imagine. And so this is why when we look at the actual moments of the cross, for instance, in Matthew chapter 27, Jesus cries out, in despair and affliction of soul. Here, let's go to the scene here, the crucifixion, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. It says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus in his soul, is experiencing this feeling of utter abandonment. He's not really abandoned by the Father, 
but he's feeling this utter shame, guilt, and abandonment of the weight of all of the sin of the whole world, this incredible affliction of soul that we cannot possibly understand, so that he quotes Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if we actually go back and we look at Psalm 22 that Jesus quotes in context, we're going to see that it all ends well. We're going to see that that this act of suffering brings about the redemption of the world that has been promised. But in this moment, Jesus cries out in what would seem to be to us absolute despair. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But make no mistake about this. When we look at Isaiah chapter 53, it's incredibly clear that that's exactly what the Lord demanded of his son. And if you say... Whose idea was this that this should take place? The answer is unequivocally clear in Isaiah 53. The Lord required it of His Son. Look at it three times in your Bible. Look at Isaiah 53, 4. He was smitten by who? By God. And look at 53, 6. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And skip ahead to verse 10. We're going to cover this next week. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him and have put him to grief. So if we ask the question, whose will was this that the son should suffer in this way? There's only one answer, and that is it is the will of God that he should endure this. Now, who is the beneficiary? To, to whom do these benefits of redemption apply? The answer to us. And just as certainly as it's clear that the Lord required of this, of his son, so also it is clear that the beneficiaries of this atoning work is us. And we need just to, you need to ask a question here. Who's us? Look, look at the pronouns here. He was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities, brought us peace. By his wounds we are healed. Who is us? Our, all, and we in Isaiah 53. Let's tease it out for a minute. The Jews? Too narrow. Because Christ came not only to save believing Jews, but believing Gentiles as well. We saw that in the other servant songs. His mission is broad. So too narrow to say just the Jews. Well, should we say that Christ bore the sin of every sinner? Too broad. Because one must, first of all, confess their sin. They must acknowledge their iniquity. They must admit their transgressions. And so the best that we can say here is that Christ's suffering work is sufficient for the whole world, but it is efficient only for the elect, that is to say, those who repent and believe. Okay. His atoning work avails for those who believe. And so we make a distinction between the sufficiency of his death, which one drop of his saving blood could remit not only our sins here in the room, but all of the sins of every person, every born, in every world, in every universe. One drop of his saving blood has the sufficiency to atone for absolutely everybody. But efficiency applies only to his elect, that is, those who would confess and believe in time and receive him as their Lord and Savior. My question is, are you part of the we here in Isaiah 53? Are you part of the us, part of the all, in verses 5 and 6 of this text? I hope that that is so of you. Now, we could spend... Um, a lot more time combing through the details of this prophecy. We certainly could. In fact, uh, time permitting on another occasion, we may look to how this text predicts accurately 700 years before it happened his trial. That he was oppressed, that he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. That literally happened before Pontius Pilate. Just read the Gospels. Uh, we can read in this prophecy how our Christ died. Uh, look at verse 8. We see that here. He was cut off from the land of the living. This prophecy is very clear that Messiah would be, would be dead. He would die. Okay? And we can see in this prophecy here his grave and his burial 
how it is with a rich man. We see that also in the Gospels. We could go through this prophecy and comb through all of the rich and glorious details that precisely predict the sufferings of our Messiah 700 years before it happened. And Lord willing, one day we will do that. But as we close this morning, I simply want to say to you these applications. First of all, and I'll be brief. If you're a Christian... If you're a Christian, then all of this is for you. You are free. Your sin is gone. Your sin is atoned for. Your sin has been wiped away, not just now, but forever. What sin? All of them. Which ones? Your past, your present, Even your future sins, you haven't even committed them yet. And because of what Christ has done, you are completely absolved and free. Okay? If you're not a Christian, then we cannot say that about you. Perhaps one day we will be able to say that about you. But if you're not a Christian, then you are still in your sins. And the horrible news about Isaiah 53 is simply this. If you don't have a Savior, if you don't have a mediator, if you don't have one who has atoned for you, then all of the pains of the cross and worse will be applied to you in hell forever. Okay? The gospel is only good news to us when we first of all understand the bad news that sin leads to death and death leads to hell. But for us and in us we have Christ, the Savior, who has borne our weight of our guilt and our shame and our sin and our wretchedness. And what's extraordinary about this prophecy is that 700 years before it happened, Isaiah predicted it exactly as it would be fulfilled. This is the good news of the gospel. Praise be to God.